we are going to discuss a very interesting or rather very pertinent topic of religion. I have hardly any doubt that all of you will affirm the fact that in the history of human existence, religion has played a dynamic and crucial role, not only in the understanding of human life, but also of the surrounding world. Religion is like a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it has inspired people down the ages to scale the heights of moral greatness, to consecrate their lives to God in unconditional love, and even to make supreme sacrifices for their faith. However, on the other hand, as English philosopher of religion, Jonathan Sachs in his word, not in God's name, says, I quote, in the history of religion, people have killed in the name of God of life, waged war in the name of the God of peace, hated in the name of God of love, and practiced cruelty in the name of God of compassion. When this happens, God speaks and says, not in my name. To explore, analyze, and to introspect on the different facets of religion and its impact on communal harmony, which is, which is not just important, but rather necessary for our common well-being, and to possibly provide a road map for a way forward, we have with us five eminent personalities. Yeah, we have four. Yeah, one is absent. So we begin with the first paper by Professor Kishu Daswani, The Impact of Anti-Conversion Laws on Interfaith Harmony. Professor Daswani is from the Government Law College, Mumbai, and also St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. Professor, may I kindly invite you to present your thoughts? Okay. Uh Good morning, everyone. So, okay, yeah. So there's a good possibility I'm going to present the darkest paper in this conference. You know, I I've been hearing about uh, interfaith since morning, and I'm, I work in interfaith. And so just to put a caveat here, if you think I'm saying that is judgmental, that is not my intention. If you think I'm some, saying something that's going to provoke you, then that is my intention. So uh, feel free to you know, put down your uh, questions or that you may have certain doubts. Um, you know, we have got a spate of anti-conversion laws in the country today. We have got 11 states that have got anti-conversion laws, each one probably more draconian than the other. Um, to introduce you to these anti-conversion laws, you will see it is not a modern phenomenon. In fact, anti-conversion laws have been there since 1936. Um, in fact, they have been around, uh, including elements of contacting a district magistrate in case you want to convert, so on and so forth. It's in the state of Raigarh, Patna, Udaipur, these were all pre-independence. These states were independent. The Brit British had suzerainty over them, but they did not control them. And there was a genuine fear that there's going to be conversion by Christianity of the Hindus, and consequently these laws didn't exist. Coming to today's time, um, switch to the next slide. Um, these are the states that have got the anti-conversion laws. You know, I haven't put Chhattisgarh there because the law is still under formulation. And the original states that had anti-conversion laws were Orissa and Madhya Pradesh, way back in 1967 and 1968. These states put down the law in place and they were challenged in the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court held that these anti-conversion laws are valid. So there's this very famous judgment called the Reverend Stanislaw's judgment which said these anti-conversion laws are valid. I'll briefly explain to you on what basis the Supreme Court said this. Um, could you have the next slide please? And I introduce you to 
an article of the Constitution, that is Article 25, and as you can see it says, gives every person the right of the freedom of conscience, the right to freely profess, practice, and propagate religion. Now when we say the word propagate, it really means I inform you about my religion, I tell you about my religion, but is there a natural fallout? If my religion is sufficiently intellectually rational, you will then like my religion and you will convert. So propagation ultimately would lead to conversion, but this right to propagate has a restriction. And the restriction is, you will not disturb public order. So the Supreme Court in 1977 said, if people are being converted to one particular religion, there's going to be communal passions excited, and that's going to lead to a public order problem. Hence, your right to propagate will not include the right to convert. I repeat, the right to convert. You may convert voluntarily, but nobody has the right to convert you. So if there's a law that says thou shall not convert, that law is valid because it's not taking away any of your rights. Now when we do talk of propagation, you know, uh, you can also see it's the right of freedom of conscience. One of the defects in the Supreme Court judgment was, if I do not tell you about my religion, how would you know about my religion? If you do not know about my religion, how would you have the choice to take on another religion not being the one that you were born with? So this is now being agitated at the Supreme Court once again, that the right to propagate my religion gives you the right of conscience to select the religion that you want. It's, it's, it's a kind of a very, very fine thread of law that we're looking at. The next slide. So, in the Reverend Stanislaus versus the state of Madhya Pradesh, it was said, you will not convert, though you can propagate. Now, in the backdrop of this 1977 Supreme Court judgment, with the covenant government is harping upon that anti-conversion laws are valid, we will see the current trend of anti-conversion laws. Now, the words of the law say, you cannot convert somebody by fraud. That's fine. By force, that's fine. By inducement, it's fine. By undue influence, coercion. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not need a law for this. The Indian Penal Code clearly defines the offense of cheating which says, if I induce somebody by deceit to do something which he otherwise would not have done, he will go to jail. Colors. However, there's a law in place that says, you will not do by force, fraud, inducement, undue influence, caution. I left out one little word there. And the word is allurement. You know, the acts so nicely define the word allurement. And as you will see on the slide there, the word allurement is temptation in any form, gift, gratification, easy money. You take somebody out for dinner, he likes you, he converts to your religion. That conversion is illegal according to the current laws. The word allurement is so vague. Look at the last sentence there. It says, if I promise you a better lifestyle, or if I say that you're going to be the object of divine displeasure, or otherwise. Now what does otherwise cover? Does it cover everything under? You know, normally you say, get me a pen, a paper, a, a, a pencil. You know, they are connected words. Do you think better lifestyle and divine displeasure are connected? No, they are not. So the word otherwise really can be anything under the sun. Now, the government is telling you today that if somebody converts due to allurement, that conversion will be illegal. You know, Canada allures us for a better lifestyle. We drop our nationality and go to Canada. Interestingly, interestingly, and this I take from what I hear from uh, current proponents of this law, that Savarkar said, Changing our religion is equal to changing our nationality. So by that logic, if we are allured to go to Canada, the government should put a stop to that as well, because that is arising out of allurement. Um, going a step further, and I'll try and rush through this, I know my time is limited. Uh, the government says, if you want to convert, you have to inform the government 60 days before you convert. The person who converts you, has to inform the government 20, 30 days before he converts you that he is going to convert. 
After this, the district magistrate to whom you inform will send the police to your house to find out why are you converting. Yes, sir. Why are you converting? We need to know. The state needs to know why you are converting. The cause of your conversion. What are the factors that led to your conversion? Why is the state coming into my private life? My freedom of conscience, according to the Supreme Court and the Buddha Swami judgment, say, it's my choice. But the state is coming. I can be a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian. I can be a, a, a Sikh. I can be a Jew. I can't be a Parsi. Be born into it. I can be agnostic. I can be atheist. Why does the state need to know? And it doesn't stop there. After I tell the state I'm converting, the state will put up a notice telling the whole world that I have converted. So not only is my private religion, or your religion is, is, is a private equation between me and God. So why does everybody else in the community need to know that I have converted? So slowly and steadily the state is prying into our private lives with zero or no justification. And this is where I firmly believe the constitutionality of these laws will be dropped. Um, can you go to the next one, please? Um, let's see what's the punishment. Very interesting. You get up to five years, ten years, fifty thousand rupees fine. You give uh, five lakh rupees to the person you have converted. Um, you know that five years, ten years is very interesting. If I convert a man, the punishment is up to five years. Okay? He could be an illiterate man. But if I convert a woman, the punishment is up to ten years. You know, she could be a professor, and she could be very well versed, but this is a punishment because there's a direct assumption that minors, women, and persons from scheduled caste, scheduled tribes are incapable of making a decision, and hence the punishment for that is greater. For some of these offenses, the punishment is one year. Mind you, under the Criminal Procedure Code, if the punishment is more than three years, the offense is cognizable and non bailable here, all the offenses are cognizable and non-bailable. You can be arrested without intervention of a magistrate, merely by the police, in case you were to do something not under this act. Um, next one. There is no provision of appeal. I cannot appeal against the order of the district magistrate. You know, my question is, what is a district magistrate doing in my life? My right to religion is my fundamental right. Am I going to be counting on some babu to decide whether my freedom of choice of religion is going to be dictated by this bureaucrat. Um, I spoke about the notice after conversion. Burden of proof. So in the event you have facilitated a conversion or you have decided to get married to somebody and that person has converted, you have to prove that the person did not convert involuntarily. The state does not have to prove that the person converted involuntarily. You have to. How do you expect ordinary people to be judges? Okay. <laughs> okay, quick. I'm going to rush through this. Now, uh, I, I got some interesting stuff to tell you. Now, in the event you were to convert from one religion to the other religion, and in the event you're coming back to your original religion, these laws do not apply. So, let me give you the framework. It says if you have converted from your ancestral religion, which could be a thousand years back, and if you come back to your ancestral religion, you do not need permission from the district magistrate. No law would apply to you. Okay? So you can see the trend that's going here. Um, see what we have. Uh, can you go to the next one, please? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, how much time do I have? I'm done, right? I got a minute? Yeah, well, so I'm going to... Uh, well, my, my, my slide kind of tells you about the anxious majority, which is also converting into vigilantism. You've got... what? One MLA in Karnataka went crying to the members of uh, the legislative assembly and said, my mother converted to Christianity. And he started crying. So the Karnataka passed the anti-conversion law. The mother comes on TV and says, I have converted voluntarily. He said, but what does a Hindu son do when his mother converts? Please find a way not let her convert. And that is why the particular law has come. Survey has been done on illegal churches, zero outcome. The Siddhars have gone around to find out which of the people who have converted involuntarily. No data points the government has. Still, the anti conversion law is in place. Um, yeah, for marriage. Okay, some of you may be interested in this. In the event you convert, in the event you convert for the purpose of marriage, you know, Dharminder became a Muslim so that he could marry somebody else other than his father. Hema Malini, right? He became. Uh, yeah? 
She's an MP now, yeah? So, the Dharmendra converted to Islam. The Allahabad High Court said this is wrong. You cannot convert to Islam for the purpose of marriage. You can only convert to Islam if you believe or have faith in Islam. That's what the Allahabad High Court said. The current Allahabad High Court judgment is you, can, you have the choice to marry who you want. And if it means that you have to convert to marry who you want, you can. And this is exactly what the law prohibits. It tells you if you convert and marry, your marriage is illegal. Hello, what happens to the children? If you marry and then convert, your marriage becomes illegal. You know, so these are certain, you know, like completely... Uh, by the way, these laws have been struck down in the Gujarat High Court. The Karnataka government has passed the same laws again. Because they want to test the Karnataka High Court. Um, so, um, I, I'll, I'll not go into constitutional detail. Just suffice to say, and Ambedkar was mentioned earlier on, and I do not need to tell you how many Dalits and how many persons from the lower caste have actually converted to Christianity and Buddhism because Hinduism is not a safe place for them to exhibit their uh, uh, full potential as human beings. I shall close with my last slide and I'll just let you read on that. Yeah, yeah thank you, Professor. I'm sorry, I, we couldn't give you more time, although you were about to provoke us, but... <laughs> Yes, so thank you so much. We have with us our next presenter, Ms. Shefali Kali from St. Xavier's College, Mapsa. Ms. Kali is going to speak on feminist process theology and alternative metaphysics of religion. Ma'am, please take your place on the podium and you can begin with your presentation. Good morning everyone. Uh, the title of my paper as read by Father is Feminist Process Theology and Alternative Metaphysics of Religion. Uh, so what I wish to state in my paper is the current religious intolerance is due to a certain metaphysical pattern that we base theology on. So what I wish to propose is can we have an alternate metaphysics which involves dialogue. And I uh, wish to say that such an uh, alternative metaphysical structure, one of uh, the places where you can find it is in feminist process theology. So I begin reading my paper. Uh, the first section is understanding religious tolerance, intolerance, sorry. Montesquieu said religious wars are not caused by the fact there is more than one religion, but by the spirit of intolerance and a spread of such intolerance can be only regarded as a total eclipse of human reason. Theology is defined by the online Merriam-Webster dictionary as a study of religious faith, practice and experience of the study of God and God's relation to the world. It also stands for a theological theory or system, a distinctive body of theological truths. Now in attempting to rationalize an understanding of God and his relations with the world, I believe that a sense of dogmatism seeps in. Uh, dogmatism in this theory interferes with the practice of that faith. Such a dogmatism is often expressed in religious attitudes of individuals, acts of violence in the name of religion, a sense of false superiority about one's religion, etc. I believe that one of the reasons responsible for such intolerance is the lack of reasonable engagement amongst religions. A ground for possible reasonable engagement can be found by examining the metaphysical structures of religious theologies. Feminist process philosophy offers one such metaphysical structure which may open, open up avenues for reasonable engagement. This paper explores such a possibility by offering a bird's eye view of the same and uh, it is largely based on the paper written by Susan Heckman uh, her titled Feminist New Materialism and Process Theology Beginning the Dialogue. Now what is process philosophy? Heckman believes that process theology uh, influenced by process philosophy is one of the most important developments of the 20th century which is supportive of feminist philosophy. Process philosophy is premised on the dynamicness of the being. It holds that reality is not as static as supposed by the substance philosophers, but dynamic in nature. 
In this respect, they stand in opposition to substance philosophy. The substance philosophers can be traced back to the ancient Greek philosophers as Parmenides and Aristotle. Parmenides were people who thought of reality as simple, internally undifferentiated, static, and therefore change was treated as unreal. As opposed to such a view, process philosophers treat becoming or change as a fundamental unit of philosophical concerns. Substance philosophers conceive of permanence as the real essence of the substance and its changing features as unreal, whereas process philosophers treat change as the real essence and permanence as its unreal characteristic. Substance philosophers focus on what is out there and process philosophers deal with what is occurring. Uh, process philosophers often take support from Heraclitus, who believe that the only change, that only change, sorry, is truly permanent. Heraclitus believed that one cannot step in the same river twice as both the water and the man have changed. The world we experience today is a world which is filled with change and we observe this change in ourselves as well. The world is perceived as an interaction of physical, social, organic and cognitive processes and one of the metaphysical categories is the functionality of the entity which is expressed in what it does. Coming to process theology, process theology draws its roots from the process philosophy given by Alfred North Whitehead and Charles, uh, Charles Hart Schoen. Uh, Whitehead in his book Process and Reality written in 1978 states that process and being furthermore are inextricably inter intertwined. The actual world is a process and that process is the becoming of actual entities. Each actual entity is an organic process. The process itself is the constitution of the actual entity. Whitehead believes that one must begin with experience as process philosophy begins with the experience of uh, relatedness of entities. Charles Hartshorn in his work Omnipotence and Other Theological Mistakes describes God as not a being perfect, omnipotent, omniscient and unchanging. Such a God is sympathetic to the lives of all and therefore has feelings. Humans do have freedom of will as this God is not deterministic. Process philosophy rejects the dualisms of man-nature, mind-body which forms the basis of anthropocentrism in religions. For Whitehead, all opposites are reconciled in the nature of things, which in turn influences his view of theology. He believes God to be an actual entity who creates the world and the world in turn creates God. Thus, he gets affected by the temporal processes. The most important meta metaphysical category of process theology is the notion of relatedness. God relates to all and in turn are, are, is related to and uh, sorry and the all that is the beings are related with each other. The world is thus characterized as relational and interdependent. In this interdependent world, God needs individuals as much as individuals need each other. Hartshorn expresses it in the following statements of his work of Omnipotence and Other Theological Mistakes. He says, apart from our interest in others, what are we? Apart from the others, we have no self. What is a person if not being qualified and conditioned by social relations, relations with other persons? Whitehead also resonates the same in, uh, sentiment when he holds that every entity needs the society to exist. Process theology and feminist philosophy are two major areas of overlap, rather have two ma uh, major areas of overlap, that is, their mutual rejection of the Cartesian self and the notion of relatedness. Catherine Keller, uh, an important feminist process theologian, drawing on the notion of relatedness, calls women to think or rethink their self in terms of differentiation in relation, not as apart from, not as apart from it. She questions: Need differentiation imply separation? Need connection imply merger? The self is a complex mix of, mix of feelings that rises up in response to the feelings of the plural world. The result is radical relatedness. To aid this rethinking of self, Keller turns to process theology. Uh, which states that women have always known their self and all of reality to be interconnected. Such a self is a process with no fixed substance. Uh, such kind of an idea of relational self is also supported by feminist epistemologists who think about or rather who conceive women to, uh, to occupy a unique vantage point. By being at the margins, a woman enjoys a unique epistemic privilege 
uh, it aids them in perceiving the connectedness of the self with that of the others. I would like to conclude by saying that substance philosophy demands a Cartesian knower who apprehends the truth as being out there. Religious theologies, by replacing substance with God, attempt to study God as an entity with fixed essence. Such metaphysical theorizing provides uncertain grounds for reasonable engagement with other religions. On the other hand, feminist process theology in bringing out a metaphysical structure of relatedness provides conducive grounds for reasonable engagement with other religions. When one realizes the connectedness of with the other, the other gets obliterated as a separate entity which in turn enhances empathy and cooperation. This in turn fortifies an uh, atmosphere uh, conducive for reasonable engagement for a fruitful dialogue amongst religions. Thank you, Ms. Kali, for your presentation on feminist process theology, providing an alternative for interfaith dialogue. Our next speaker we have is Reverend Father Roman Rodriguez, Assistant Professor of Rosary College of Arts and Commerce, Navali. Father Rodriguez will be speaking to us on the Rassianic Jesus, a study of emotional Jesus. Yeah, Father, you have eight minutes for your presentation. The paper, of, the title of my paper is the Rassianic Jesus, a study of emotional Jesus. Human being is emotional by nature and emotions are intrinsic to humans. This is what it makes human being different from all other beings. Emotions are not emotional by themselves but they become emotional depending on various external factors and environment. In any given environment, a person may respond differently to a different situation depending on the place, person and time. It is in this context a person is known to be what he is, as in loving, caring, or angry, or hateful. The paper titled Assigning Jesus will mainly focus on the human aspect of Jesus having emotions and governed by the beingness of a being. So this paper will project Jesus as an emotional human being through the scriptural basis. The term Rasayanic is a new coined term the term Rasayanic is an amalgamation, amalgamation of two concepts, namely Ras and the suffix Yanik as in Masayanic. Ras is an Indian term which signifies the emotions of any human being. Literally, it refers to a taste, Swad. It is a feeling or an emotion that is felt after reading a piece of literature or watching an act of action or listening to any sound. In the field of literature, and especially in poetics, Vishwanath, an Indian scholar, will say, Rasatmakam Kavyam, Rasatmakam Vakyam Kavyam, which means any sentence which has got Ras in it is a poem. Or in other words, Ras is a soul of literature, and as long as you don't get Ras or that emotion in that particular literature, piece of literature, then it cannot be termed as literature. According to various Indian scholars, the number of verse differs. Some are of the opinion that there are eight, some nine, others ten or eleven in number. Indian culture and Indian literature speaks mainly of nervous, nine emotions, which are said to be coherent in every human person. This theory of nervous is given by an Indian scholar called Bharat Muni. Bharat Muni is known as the father of Indian Natya Shastra and according, and according to him, he defines the theater of Nat Natak Nata as Natyam Rasatmakam Kavyam. The concept of Ras is fundamental to many forms of Indian art including dance, music, musical theater, cinema and literature. Type of no Ras 
types of nerve rus. As mentioned earlier, the number of rus varied scholar to scholar, but the standard number of rus was retained to nine. Shanta, Shanta rus is a later addition to the original number of eight. During the various stages of Jesus' ministry, rus is said to be making a vent which signifies and expresses the ontological of Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. At the time of death of Lazarus, Jesus weeps. When Jesus saw the disciples speaking sternly against the people bringing their children to Jesus to be blessed, Jesus was indignant towards them. These sentiments and feelings can be encapsulated in the envelope of Rus. As said earlier, there are nine different types of Rus and any feeling or emotion can be classified under this nervous. They are namely Sringara, that means love, Karuna, that means compassion or pathos, Hasyaras, that is laughter or humor, Viraras, is valor or heroism, Rodraras, that means anger, Adbuttaras, means wonder, Vayanatras, means fear or terror, Vivatsaras, disgust, and lastly, the Santaras, that is peace or serenity. Jesus in Navras. Jesus and Sringaras, the first Ras. I have loved you, abide in my love. John 15, 9 says. I love you, John 21, 5. These expressions itself indicate the Sringaras in Jesus. Outside these two, there are many passages which mainly speak about love and calling the people to do the same. This Sringararas can also be seen in the praxis of Jesus. The greatest act of Jesus dying on the cross was an overflowing expression of Sringararas. And Jesus also states in John 5.13, There is no greater love than to give one's life for his own friend. The second, Jesus and the Karunaras. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them and cured them. Matthew 14.14 14. When Jesus saw the widow of Nain weeping for his dead son, he had compassion for her and raised her son. Luke 7, 11 to 15. This rus is a special characteristic of Jesus, which denotes the ness of a human being. Jesus, as a human being, possessed high level of karuna. Jesus and Hasyarus, the third rus. There, is, there are not many instances wherein Jesus can be praised as a humorous person. But we can surely predict and suppose Jesus having a corner of a humor through the different scriptural events. In the context of short statured Zacchaeus, being not able to see Jesus among the crowd, he runs and climbs on the tree in Luke 19 uh, verses 1 to 10. This scene must have surely amused Jesus. Secondly, Jesus' sermon and preaching was so lengthy, people would have surely got bored with them. But we find no mention of such situations. Through this, we can conclude that Jesus' dialogues would have been lively and interesting with humorous sayings in between, of which we don't find any mention in the scriptures. For that matter, the movie Jesus of Nazareth also depicts humorous laughing, dancing Jesus. Jesus is shown one like others playing in water, splashing water on his disciples and sharing some light moments with them. Fourth, Jesus and Viraras. The Rus depicts Jesus as hero or performing a heroic act. Heroic act is one that knowing the adverse effect the act will have on oneself, the person still continues to, the, to do the act and succeeds in doing it. One Sabbath, Pharisees and the scribes were watching Jesus, whether he will heal a withered man so that they may accuse him and put him to death. But Jesus, knowing their plans, still heals the withered man and in turn questions them about the Sabbath. This boldness on the part of Jesus reveals his virus. The fifth rest, Jesus and Rodraras. In apparent, the apparent incident that comes to our mind when we recall the angry Jesus is what we find in all the Gospels of the New Testament is cleansing of the temple. According to the Gospel writers, it is mentioned that in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and dogs, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. money. So he made a whip out of cords and drew all from the temple who were buying and selling there. 
He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. The sixth thrust, Jesus and Adbuttaras. A feeling of wonder or marvel known as Adbuttaras can be pointed in two instances in the Bible where Jesus is said to be marvel about the faith stories. Firstly, he marveled at the Roman centurion's faith in him and his, and his words. As Jesus was on his way to Roman centurion's house to heal his servant, the Roman centurion himself says to Jesus, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word and my servant shall be healed. Because I too have servants under me and they do what I ask them to do. In reply to this, Jesus replies in wonder, I have not found so great faith, not even in Israel. The second one I will skip. I will move on to the seventh verse, Jesus and the Bhayanak verse. My father, it is not possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not me what I want, but you, but what you want. Before Jesus will make this prayer to his father, the grieved, the grieved and agitated Jesus says to his disciples, I am deeply grieved even to death. This is a direct connotation of fear. Overwhelming Jesus. Mark will say, in his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. The eighth verse, Jesus and Vipatsaras, woes in the Bible or Gospels, expresses the feelings of disgust and mainly towards Pharisees and scribes. Jesus was satiated with the attitude and behavior of the elders and the Pharisees because they didn't practice what they preached and made life for the people all the more difficult. Matthew 23, 1 to 26 is full of woes against scribes and Pharisees. Jesus compares them to the whitewashed tombs, the, to the plate and the cup. Reading Matthew 23 evokes in the reader itself the disgusting feelings against Pharisees. If the reader itself gets repulsed with the passage, how more Jesus will have not been disgusted seeing their way of life. The ninth and the last verse, Jesus and the Santaras. If we come across any picture of Jesus and if we focus on, on his face, we at once get attracted to Jesus' calm and peaceful disposition of his face. The first look on the face of Jesus points out his Santaras, because of which many were comfortable with him and wanted to spend more time with him. Jesus was peace and he went on proclaiming and sharing this peace wherever he went, saying, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. So to say, this was his typical greeting wherever he was seen and also taught the disciples to do the same. Other instances I would like to skip and I am moving directly to the epilogue to the conclusion. According to Kappen's interpretation of Jesus in the Indian context, it is through Jesus the man that we recognize the divine. It is our existential experience of the divine that makes us more human. So to encounter Jesus is to encounter the divine. Wolfhard Pannenberg, studying Christology from below says, instead of presupposing the divinity of Jesus, we must first inquire about how Jesus' appearance in the history led to the recognition of his divinity. Jesus is both divine and human. But it is knowing, but it is in knowing the human nature of Jesus that we can experience the divinity of Jesus more, more closely. By examining the emotional side of Jesus through nervous, different aspects of Jesus being fully human is present before us. And this knowers can in turn help us in contemplating the complete face of Jesus. As Rudolf Bultmann's existential Christology will suggest, we cannot speak of God or Christ without reference to our own existence. So also, this Rasayanic Jesus should help people to see Jesus as one of their own in different circumstances and in different emotions of one's life. This will grant people a hope and we got to cope up with their own sentiments of life and weave and leave Jesus more existentially rather than as a distant reality. Thank you. Thank you, Father Roman, for providing us a picture of Jesus 
as an emotional being, emotional person. So we have our last speaker during this session, Mr. Jude Fernandez, belonging to Nirmala Institute of Education, Panjim Goa. Mr. Jude will be speaking on the brand new testament, a sweet satire on faith in the 21st century. Yeah, Jude, you can begin. You have 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you, sir. What would you do if you knew exactly how much time you had left to live? Would your life be any different? Also, do you know that God lives in Belgium with his wife and daughter? No, no, I'm not here to make any radical claims or to start a new cult. These are two possibilities that are explored in a 2015 religious comedy film titled The Brand New Testament. The film is written, directed and produced by Jacob Van Dormel and is a joint venture among three neighboring countries, Belgium, France and Luxembourg. The film won various accolades and went on to be selected as the Belgian entry for the 88th Academy Awards. In this paper, I have discussed the confluence of religion, art and cinema through the film. Along with the plot and character analysis, my review considers the brand new testament as a parody that was praised upon its release. Finally, this paper calls for the debate on whether a modern retelling of the Bible can be humorous and harmless. Inspired by themes and teachings from the Holy Bible, the brand new testament depicts God as a disgruntled father figure who likes to make humans suffer. A lot of misery and a little happiness to give them false hope. An existential view that is reminiscent of plays by Jean-Paul Sartre and Samuel Beckett. When God's daughter, Ea, discovers this ill-treatment, she decides to rebel against him by sending a mass text message informing all humans of their scheduled date and time of death. Then, she ventures into the world to gather six apostles. A sad, one-armed woman, an unhappy corporate employee, an unloved sex maniac, a killer, a woman in a failed marriage, and a gender dysphoric child. Meanwhile, God frustratedly tries to undo the damage by searching for his daughter. These parallel stories lead to an exciting finish. Through various mediums of art, God is often envisaged as a majestic figure with a long beard, a flowing robe and infinite power at his disposal. However, this film paints God in an unconventional manner. God had strictly laid down a number of rules for his wife and daughter. For example, it was forbidden to enter his office, which was a locked room with drawers and an old computer. Time and again, God comes across as an ungrateful figure who takes advantage of his position. God preferred the absence of his son, JC, you can guess who JC stands for, who had improvised teachings against God's plan, which resulted in a dispute between the two. Unable to bear her father's loud, impatient and abusive temper, Ea wishes to rebel against him and all the wickedness he stands for. Although the Brand New Testament never mentions the word Christian, Holy Bible, or even Jesus Christ, it is clear that the film is heavily derived from Christian theology and addresses its eventful past. The dilemma in the Brand New Testament is caused by a tussle within God's family, leading to an act of rebellion with adverse consequences. Ea abandons her parents and ventures into the world of her own accord, aware that she was endangering herself. The computer was a valuable weapon for God. Without it, he was stripped of his authority. 
A YouTube review by the film Recapped states it bluntly, I quote, This God is not a messiah or savior. He is simply a creator who was bored of designing things, unquote. Since God was used to a life of unchecked authority, he was now in a race against time to regain power before it was too late. Left with no other option, God had to humiliate himself and crawl through a washing machine into the streets of Brussels, Belgium. God noticed how humans were exploiting their limited freedom, a matter of grave concern in the scriptures. By taking matters into their own hands, people were chasing material pleasures instead of aiming for eternal rewards. Money and muscle power had created discrepancies in terms of wealth and welfare. The purpose of living was buried under piles of consumerism and capitalism. The stress of coping with each day had taken a toll on the physical and mental health of the population. Thus, God was losing his privilege, privileges and relevance in a world full of attractions and distractions. Faith and devotion rarely stood a chance because humans were preoccupied with their own issues. Though the film brings human errors to the spotlight, it does not make any accusations. Neither does it suggest any concrete solutions to avoid or overcome our modern problems. What the film does offer is a celebration of possibilities, narrated from the perspective of a child. It is a visual and verbal delight filled with questions that linger in your mind long after the final credits have rolled up. Try as we might, our worries cannot be done away with the wave of a wand or say a command on God's computer. Transforming our world is not an overnight process. It will require a conscious and continuous effort on our part to exist in harmony. Is, there isn't a better time to begin than right here and now. Who are we waiting for? To conclude, the Gospels of the Brand New Testament flow smoothly from a funny exposition to its climax and denouement. Faith, frolic, and fun are the three integral elements here. As an absurd retelling of a solemn text, the film does not try to be blasphemous or offensive. Rather, it can tickle you with its jokes and impress you with its imagination. Its intentions are genuine, to entertain viewers with a blend of religion, art, and cinema. This film is proof that a modern retelling of the Holy Bible can be humorous, yet harmless. This is more than a sweet satire of the 21st century. It is a creative invite to reform our lives and write our own brand new testament. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chute, for providing some food for our imagination. So now we have a very important part of this session. All this time, in fact, Sadbao invites us for a fruitful and meaningful dialogue. The presenters give us monologue. Now it's time for us to have a dialogue. Yes, Professor Keshu, can you please come up on the stage, please? Jude, Professor Kali, and Father Roman. <coughs> yes, could we have your name, please, first? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle, and my question is for Professor uh, Keshu. Yeah. So, Professor, uh, in your presentation, you said that, uh, yeah, and it is true that the district collector, you know, after people uh, come to him uh, saying that they want to convert, and he puts up a notice outside the office. So does that, does it violates the right to privacy, which is a fundamental right. So what is the 
this is a fundamental right. Again, it is upheld by the Supreme Court. And this anti-conversion laws that are coming up, they violate the right to privacy. So if it comes up in the Supreme Court, I believe that this right to privacy will triumph over this anti-conversion laws. What do you have to say on that? So, you know, I sincerely hope so, that it does. But um, times are different nowadays. See, we have to understand these anti-conversion laws are not really for protecting a given religion. They are designed intentionally to reduce interfaith harmony. Not more than 3% or 2% of the marriages in India are interfaith. Right? That's not a large number. And as Ambedkar had said, when you create marriage between caste, you remove inter-caste disharmony. Marriage between faiths will actually improve interfaith harmony. So see, these laws seem to be designed to actually push religious minorities into their place. And because the ghar vapsi does not involve any process at all, it seems to appear that there is an intention to reconvert everybody back to Hinduism and create a one-way traffic. See, so um, we are very happy. I just want to point one last thing. The Stanislaw judgment that I spoke about was before privacy was considered a fundamental right. So in the context of privacy now being a fundamental right, I think the decision would drastically change. In fact, the Gujarat High Court has struck down this provision as unconstitutional. But the Karnataka government has re-put it in the law. So, you know, there is a, a, a clear case of try, 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 you know, until you succeed. That's what it appears to me. But we have to just wait how the Supreme Court looks at it. Uh, of course, we got D.Y. Chandrachud, who wrote the privacy judgment right now as the Chief Justice. So, if that's any indication, we know how it may go. Um, <laughs> we leave that for another day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is a comment actually, uh, the fact that you said it's uh, 5 to 10 years and therefore outside the bail, uh, you know, you, it's non-bailable. So I think uh, this is a case again of the process being the punishment, right? I mean, the idea is not uh, whether it's right or wrong, but you create enough obstacles where uh, the, when the process becomes the punishment, then uh, you are dissuading. You know, I do not file my income tax returns for three years. Government allows me to file revised returns. If I do not inform the magistrate that I'm converting, I go to jail for five years. Now. It's in front of you what the intention of the legislation is. Uh, it, it's quite clear. Do we have any more questions? Just an observation, really. We all know what's happening in debitation, right? the latest case being BBC. But, uh, Father Roman, uh, thank you for bringing to mind the emotional side of Jesus. I just wanted to make an observation about rational emotive therapy. Okay, I mean, I'm talking more in terms of uh, the negative emotions that come up in people. Uh, basically because of the self-talk that we have. It's actually sort of adding on to your thing because I'm, a, I'm sort of a trainer myself. So, uh, helping people deal with negative emotions which might otherwise result in negative behavior. So, you know, all emotions are due to self-talk. So, if we correct our self-talk, we can actually correct the resultant behavior. So, that's something which all of us need to practice. But thank you for bringing out the aspect of Jesus as a humorous person and many other emotions. Thank you. Just an observation I wanted to make. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, every, uh, sorry, it's good afternoon everyone. I'm uh, Elaine Koilo, a teacher trainee from Nirmala Institute of Education. My question is again to Professor Kishu. Uh, Professor, you spoke about uh, the district magistrate who sends out, uh, who's, the, there's public notice that goes out each time a person would like to convert. So obviously if this is out into the community and people read about it, is it valid or is, does this kind of thing happen where the family, the community or the society is able to object to put a stand against this kind like, okay, you cannot go ahead with the marriage or are there repercussions such that they are shunned from the society? 
So there are two reasons why this happens. A, ostensibly for any person to object, and the objectors are recorded in the district magistrate's register. But more importantly, it is to allow a vigilante group to go and convince the family not to engage in that conversion. Now, if anybody wants to convert, what's his family going to say? Yo, man, go and convert. They're naturally going to be people who are going to be against the conversion within the family. That's how India works. Interesting thing is that any person can file a complaint against a conversion. And as Gayatri said, the process is the punishment. So any person, whether they are involved or not involved, I must tell you this law is specifically designed to make voluntary religious conversion impossible. Little. Voluntary. Yes. You want to do it, the processes are so harsh along the way, it is to make it impossible. There is no other functionality, no other law is like this. Just as Madan Lokur said, this law is so strange. Why would somebody even have a law like this? So this is, to my mind, and, and I said this is going to be a negative presentation, to my mind, we need seminars like this to actually oppose a particular design by the government to, in fact, block interfaith harmony. This is not a matter of chance. There have been anti-conversion laws before. They have been mild. These ones are draconian. So, so the object is not only the family and objectors, the it's object is also for the vigilante to uh, get after the families and threaten them, block them, etc. So on and so forth. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm Dr. Brian from Kamal College. I have a question for Shifali. Uh, thank you very much for your overview of, uh, you know, the philosophical roots of your argument. I myself am an, an admirer of Heraclitus, and just yesterday I quoted him to my students. Um, I was with you when you spoke about uh, women having, oh, that, rather rejecting the Cartesian self. But I was not able to get on board when you made a statement saying uh, women have a unique uh, epistemological advantage. Can you elaborate, please? Yeah, this is about uh, a vantage point, what I uh, refer to. Now, ep uh, feminist epistemologists who study knowledge views about women, uh, what they say is when, uh, and this was actually said in uh, respect with religion, uh, a woman, uh, if you see her in the sphere of religion, she's not in the religion literally. She's on the borders. Uh, why is she in the borders? She's in the borders because it is the man and the males uh, uh, who uh, do the, the, you know, either it be theology or, you know, the practice part. They, they make the rules. Uh, so she's the other there. Now, uh, when any person stands on the borders, you see things quite differently rather than seeing things from the center. So there are two perspectives here. One is the perspective from the center, which would be very male-centric because even if you look at the rules of religion, uh, consider even rules of purity, menstruation, they are always, uh, uh, you can actually understand that they don't understand what goes on with the woman's body. The woman's body is the other. When you are seeing things from the perspective of the other, you have a very unique epistemic privilege because you know yourself and you can also see how the other sees you. So this gives you kind of a double advantage. So that is what I meant is that when you are seeing religion, when a woman sees religion, she sees it very differently from how a man sees religion because she is always the other. Uh, uh, I'll just go a little further. There are also perspectives who say that, but then there are women-centric rituals. Uh, if you examine these rituals which are women-centric, you will find that there is no ritual per se that at least I have come across which honors a woman for being a woman. It is always because you are somebody's wife, you are somebody's mother, but what, uh, is there any such place for her for being herself? You don't honor womanhood in its sense. Uh, you may call woman a goddess, but uh, 
is she, is she really given the same status because you still have uh, that particular ritual where she'll be uh, you know deified but when she goes home does she not face the same abuse which she has been facing so when a woman sees things from this border or the from the margins her perspectives are much different from what is seen from the circles from the, uh, within the center that that is what i was referring to Yeah, please, some more questions. Um, I wanted to talk to Jude. I was very delighted to see you talk about a film because uh, uh, I've been really uh, a, a big fan of the movies and uh, I've seen uh, the effect that movies have on people and it can change perspectives quite dramatically. And young people today, I think one of the nicest ways to approach harmony, to approach uh, the idea of, um, uh, you know, interfaith, uh, uh, unity is to look at uh, movies yeah so you have and movies are something that uh, have been able to work around the system very well uh, the example I'll give you is that of Iranian films they have extremely difficult uh, constraints under which they make movies and yet they're able to come up with the most beautiful uh, films which address very complex uh, um, ideas very complex emotions, very complex life situations. So I'm so glad you uh, came up with a film to uh, talk about because I think uh, young people, of, uh, the other thing I've noticed which is very different from our generation is a very large number of young people today are very visual and I think uh, that is because of the visual culture which is there. Ours is a very textual culture, you know, and the younger people are uh, very visual in their uh, the way they even think so i'm i'm uh, it's a wonderful thing and i think if young people can use these visual mediums to not necessarily rewrite the bible but to re <laughs> no i know but to reinterpret what religion is to reinterpret what uh, interfaith harmony means and they're doing it i mean i know it's happening all over the world but i think more of it has to happen in india and we can't use uh, the fact that laws are not um, very conducive to it because like I said in Iran they are managing with much harder laws to express themselves these very complex thoughts so if young people can you know use this uh, medium to talk about it I think it's a wonderful thing so thank you so much for bringing up that uh, thank uh, you very much ma'am I really appreciate that yeah, maybe the last question before we wind up this session. Yes, one last question. Uh, yeah, uh, so Professor, my question to you is, <laughs> don't be scared, uh, but uh, I'm not scared. I think you're going to convert. <laughs> I got that feeling. <laughs> yeah. So, Professor, I have over the years we have seen that uh, there have been inconsistency when it comes to judgments given by high courts and the Supreme Courts. For example, the high court struck down one uh, provision or uh, make an act unconstitutional, they declare it as null and void. But on the other hand, the same high courts, which are at power with all other high courts in India, they declare the same law as constitutional. But finally, it is the Supreme Court which gives its final verdict and which is the decision is binding upon all the um, people of the country. But before the case reaches to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court gives a verdict, there is a huge process and there is a lot of time that is involved. Some cases even take 30 years, 40 years. We get our children, grandchildren and everyone <laughs> down the line. So why, you know, we can't have a, like, the Supreme Court, why can't it give a one-stop solution? Because time and again, these cases have come again in the in its uh, court 
Right. So um, it's 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 a fairly technical answer here. You know, every case is different. What we tend to do is just take what was decided. Take the Hadia case, for example, in Kerala. You see, the Kerala High Court held that she was responsible. I mean, she had uh, was forcibly converted. She was a teacher. The Supreme Court held otherwise. Now there'd be different courts holding differently because the nuance of the case is different. The way the lawyer would argue is different. Now the Reverend Stanislaw's judgment, privacy was never argued. So that's why the judgment stands. Now, do remember the Supreme Court can also make an error depending what is presented before the Supreme Court. Uh, I would just like to go to the, the Kerala case where the temple um, Sabrimala, the Supreme Court ruled very differently because the lawyers did not present the entire matter to the Supreme Court. Now once the Supreme Court decides, and there's a big danger, once the Supreme Court decides, you know where you go after that? You pray to God. <laughs> See, remember one thing in this. So once the Supreme Court decides against you, you really have nothing. So sometimes it's good, there's a process. The Supreme Court has the ability to actually view the different high courts and how they have interpreted the matter. And they have the wealth of wisdom of the judges below them. And then they would come to the judgment. So a shortcut, a short circuit to the Supreme Court, in my opinion, is not always the best idea, especially in matters which are equally balanced on both sides. I mean, if I was to put Sabrimala, is it the right of a woman to visit a temple? At the same time, is it the right of a religious denomination to say, look, there are a million temples in India. In one temple, women are not allowed because that's my belief and that's my faith. Please respect it. See, there's no clear answer to this. In fact, there are a large number of women also who believed that in Sabrimala, women should not be allowed because that's the faith. At the same time, you have a liberal perspective, a gender perspective that says, just because I'm a woman, does it mean I do not? This is exactly what you mentioned of viewing religion from the side. So they're not easy answers. They're not easy answers. The Supreme Court has to decide an answer which is broadband constitutionally valid across several situations. High Court decides only the situation before it. So sometimes the process is good. Uh, things change, right? I mean, a very uh, um, clear example would be uh, laws about uh, sexuality. I mean, uh, views have changed over time. I mean, at one point, it was even uh, the cycle uh, in the textbooks. It was seen as uh, yeah, um, in, in, as aberration or uh, uh, illness, right? But, but in but fact, in fact, you see, society has changed, and the way religion is practiced has changed. I do not think Christianity is the same as it was 50 years ago. It's morphed and changed in the way it is actually available to the people. So is Hinduism for that matter. So religions change, people change, the practice changes. Naturally, we should be ready to go with the change. Thank you very much for all the questions uh, from our audience and a big thank you to our presenters for having a very insightful session and a discussion that followed it. Um, I would like to request Ms. Sanya Lucas to... Oh. Uh, before we go to that, may I request our chairperson to quickly share a few comments with the audience. Yes, I will share a few uh, comments. So first and foremost, I would like to thank all the presenters for their insightful and thought-provoking presentations. They were not provoking, but they were really inspiring. And it has set people to think, to revisit and review religion the way it is practiced. I'm sure none of us would like a dogmatic kind of religion which is saturated in beliefs, practices, rules, and regulations. And that's why I would, Father Roman has spoken about emotional Jesus. I think until and unless religion touches the core of our being, there won't be any transformation. It has to touch the core of our being. If it only touches the head, there is only admiration. There is no transformation. For real transformation, it has to touch the core of our heart. And I believe that we, all of us have to think 
beyond the rules and regulations and to the framework of our religion. And for that matter, I would say just offer three R's for our reflection and with, with that we wind up. The first R is rootedness. All of us have to be rooted in, our, in the true core of our religion, rootedness. Many times if I am a real Hindu, a real Muslim, a real Catholic, a real Buddhist, I don't think we will disrespect the other. We have to be rooted in our own faith first. Many times it is just a superficial understanding of our own religion which takes us that I have to fight, I have to defend my faith. But if we go to the core, to the root, I'm, I believe that all religions will tell us Sadhbao, we are one family, rootedness. Second R is relatedness. Human beings by nature are relational. And Ms. Shefali uh, Kali has brought out the process involved. It's a relationship. A woman has to be appreciated the way she helps us to relate. And I think all religions are calling us to relate. Relate with God, relate with other beings, and relate with, relate with the environment, ecology. And that's why we call the world, not humanity, we call world as Vasudaiva Kutumbakam. The whole world is one family. And when I say family, it's not just human beings. The animals, the plants, everybody. So we are relational beings. So when we relate to one another, we are glorifying God. And the last R is reciprocity. Reciprocity, that is, none of us have got the full truth. We are all searching for the truth. And that's why there has to be a spirit of openness where there is mutual give and take. Mutual teaching and mutual learning. And un until and unless we have this mutuality or reciprocity, we will end up fighting with one another. I am right, you are wrong. Can we have a time when we say, I am okay, you are also okay. Thank you and may God bless you everyone.